I need your attention now. In Jesus' name, focus, please, guys. I swear you're going to get me, and you'll be blown away if you focus. I promise you, you will. I promise you. Let's go to Luke 9, 31. Luke 9, 31. Watch this, guys. A lot of meat now if you're paying attention. I promise you. Who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, guys, this is the Mount of Transfiguration, which we'll revisit in a minute. Okay, now, in Luke 9, 31, Moses and Elijah appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration and proclaimed to Jesus his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. You got it? Now, what you may not be able to tell is that the word decease is the word exodus. You don't even need to know Greek. There you see it. It's exodon, the accusative of exodus. Moses and Elijah announced to Jesus his exodus, which would begin at Jerusalem. His exodus. So what did Moses and Elijah announce to Jesus? His exodus. Exodus, beginning at Jerusalem. Now, Jesus' exodus is that he would leave the wilderness and enter where? Heavenly Canaan, heavenly Jerusalem. Now, here's what's beautiful. All Christians who die leave this world as their wilderness and enter heavenly Jerusalem as the new Canaan. That's our exodus. And let me prove it to you. This word exodus, exodon, is used by Peter in 2 Peter 1, 14 and 15. 2 Peter 1, 14 and 15, Peter announces to the Christians, the Lord has announced to me my exodus, my departure, so I won't be with you for much longer. That's 2 Peter 1, 15. What is Peter referring to as his exodus? His leaving his earthly body, He's, he's leaving this earth to enter heavenly Jerusalem. You know what that means now? We who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are spiritual Israel. This world is our wilderness. This world is our wilderness. And we're being pursued by a new Pharaoh, Satan, who sees we've been set free from his bondage, his tyranny, our slavery to sin and Satan. And now he pursues us in the wilderness in order to torment us and bring us back into slavery, back into Egypt. But God protects us in the wilderness by giving us manna, which is the Eucharist. Bam! Are you getting it or no? I'm going to prove this systematically. John 6, 32 to 36. John 6, 32 to 36. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. Notice he's comparing himself to the bread given at the time of Moses. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, yet do not believe. Did you catch it? He likened himself to the manna given at the time of Moses. That manna is not the true bread. I am the true bread. That manna, manna is a shadow of me. So see, it confirms. Everything in the Old Testament is a shadow of a greater reality. The reality is Jesus. So what they were fed was manna. What we are fed as new Israel, spiritual Israel, is the Eucharist. That's your manna. You got it? Let me give you further proof. What is Pharaoh called in Ezekiel 29, verse 3? Speak and say, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm against you, O Pharaoh, king of Egypt, O great monster who lies in the midst of his rivers, who has said, my river is my own. I have made it for myself. You know what the word monster is? Tanin, serpent, dragon, sea monster. So Pharaoh is called the great dragon. The great serpent. And what is Satan's name? Revelation 12, 9. What is Satan's name? So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, who was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now here's what's beautiful about Revelation 12. If you continue reading 13 to 17, which we won't do, 
Revelation 12, 13 and 17 says, That great dragon, the serpent, the devil, Satan, pursued the woman. She was taken into the wilderness, protected from him. And then he pursued her children who believe in Christ. What's the point? Pharaoh is called a great serpent, great dragon. Why? Because Pharaoh is a picture of the real dragon, the real serpent, Satan. Just like Pharaoh pursued the people of God into the wilderness, this Pharaoh, Satan, pursues us. When the Lord sets us free from bondage to him and the world, pursues us into the wilderness, and this is our wilderness now, until Joshua takes us into heavenly Jerusalem. Let me show you. 1 John 5, 19. We know that we are of God. The whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. You catch it? The world is Egypt. It belongs to Satan, the Pharaoh. We were in bondage to the world and to this Pharaoh, Satan. Joshua set us free by slaying the Passover lamb himself. So now he's leading us out of the world through this wilderness experience until our exodus where our souls leave our bodies and enter heavenly Jerusalem. Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. But you have come to Mount Zion. Where? You've come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, heavenly Jerusalem. See, we are going to heavenly Jerusalem. We're leaving the wilderness to innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly of the church of the first one. So they're having church in Jerusalem. That's above the heavenly one, our mother, who are registered in heaven. Who's there in heavenly Jerusalem? God is there, the judge of all with those angels. And to the spirits of just men made perfect. Who's there? The spirits of human believers who died on earth and their spirits left their bodies who are now perfect and made whole and are dwelling in heavenly Canaan, heavenly Jerusalem, seeing God in visible glory, worshiping with the angels and beholding their new Joshua, Jesus, because notice verse 24, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel, right? Did you catch it? What does Jesus do with his blood? He sprinkles us with his blood, right? Jesus sprinkles us with his blood, right? 1 Peter 1, 2. Let's see if you're getting it. 1 Peter 1, 2. We are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and sanctification, sanctification of the Spirit. The Spirit sets us apart for obedience to Christ and to be sprinkled by the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you, peace be multiplied. The Holy Spirit sets you apart for obedience to Jesus Christ, right? And the Holy Spirit sets you apart to be sprinkled by the blood of Christ. 1 Peter 1, 2, right? What does the blood of Jesus do? What does Jesus do with his blood? Sprinkles you with his blood. And that blood is what inaugurated the new covenant. Luke 22, 19 to 20. Because I'm going to make the connection with Moses. Get ready, guys. We're going into me. You're going to get blown away. I promise you. Just pay attention. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which I give, which is given for you. Holy Spirit, save me from stammering in Jesus' name. Do this in rem remembrance of me. Now watch 20. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. You caught it? My blood, which is shed, was necessary to inaugurate and seal the new covenant. Inaugurate and seal the new covenant. And that's the blood that Jesus then sprinkles us with to make us recipients of the new covenant. You guys saw it. Jesus sprinkles us with his blood, the blood he shed to institute the new covenant because no covenant can be instituted without blood. So he uses blood to institute the new covenant to sprinkle us and cleanse us and make us recipients of that new covenant. Exodus 24. Verses 3 to 8. Exodus 24, verses 3 to 8. Pay attention, guys. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, and he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain, 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel, representing 
in each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now watch here. Then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. Now watch what Moses does, guys. Tell me if this points to Jesus. And Moses took half the blood, put it in the basins, and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant, read in the hearing of the people, and they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, this is the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. Whoa. He takes the blood, sprinkles the people with it, as Jesus sprinkled his people by his blood. You caught it? And that same blood, that same blood, he sprinkled the altar. That same blood, he sprinkled the altar. And where is Jesus? He's in heaven before the heavenly tabernacle, presenting his sprinkled blood in heaven before the altar in heaven. You got it or no? Before I move on. I'm trying to show you how all of this points to Jesus. How all of this points to Jesus. All right. So do you see how God deliberately designed the Exodus to point to Jesus? Okay, now we got that connection. Another connection. Exodus 24, same chapter. Exodus 24, same chapter. Let's read verses 9 to 11. Then Moses went up, also Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone. And it was like the very heavens in its clarity. But on the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand. So they saw God and they ate and drank. So did you catch it? God appeared to them when? After the sacrifice, the blood, to eat and drink with them. And so they were in the very presence of God, eating and drinking in the presence of God. And God in his mercy didn't consume them in his wrath because of their sin, but allowed them to see him and feast with him due to the blood that was sprinkled, eating and drinking. Jesus is God in the flesh, and he ate with his disciples the bread and the wine, which is his sacrifice, pointing to the blood that he sprinkled. So because of that sprinkled blood, he allows them to feast and eat in his presence, the very God of Israel. Notice the connection. Moses sacrificed, and they ate and drank as a result of the sacrifice in God's presence. Jesus' sacrifice, which the bread and the wine point to and become, right, enabled the disciples to then behold the very God of Israel in the flesh and eat and drink with him at the Last Supper. What did Jesus do and when did he do it? He ate the Passover. And on that Passover meal... He took the bread and the cup and gave it a new meaning. This bread and cup does not represent the old Passover. It, re it represents the new Passover, the new covenant, and the new sacrifice. My flesh, my blood, which you now partake of because of my sacrifice, enabling you and allowing you to behold the God of Israel and eat and drink before him. Luke 22, 14 and 16. When the hour had come, he sat down, and the 12 apostles with him, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 altars for 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles. Okay. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. 12 altars representing 12 tribes, 12 apostles representing 12 tribes. Beholding the God of Israel in the flesh, eating the Passover, the sacrifice before him in his presence. What do you mean? All right. So far, you, you with me? I ain't done yet. Everyone got it? Okay. You get it before I move on because I got more. All right. Now, let's go back to Exodus 24. Now, more meat pointing to Jesus. More meat pointing to Jesus. Exodus 24. Let's read 12 to 18 together. Then the Lord said to Moses, pay attention, come up to me on the mountain and be there and I will give you the tablets of stone 
and the law and commandments which I have written, that you may teach them. So Moses arose with his assistant Joshua, Yehoshua, Yeshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. You guys, do you think this is going to blow you away? Wait, eee, I got a lot more. <laughs> and he said to the elders, wait here for us until we come back to you. Indeed, Aaron and her are with you. If any man has a difficulty, let him go to them. Then Moses went up into the mountain. A cloud covered the mountain. Watch here. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. Pay attention here. So when does Moses go up to the mountain and enter the cloud? On the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. So like fire, right? So Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. So notice, he had to wait till the seventh day to go to the top of the mountain, enter the cloud, speak to God face to face, remain in his presence for 40 days and 40 nights. When? Seventh day. Where? Mountain. Who came down? God in a cloud. Now go to Exodus 23, 20 to 21. Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I prepared. This is God on the mountain speaking to Moses to talk to Israel. Here's my messenger. He will go ahead of you to prepare the way. So who's bringing them into the promised land? The angel of the Lord. Pay attention. Who's bringing them into the promised land? The angel of the Lord. Who's destroying their enemies so they can enter the promised land? The angel of the Lord. Beware of him. Beware of this angel. Obey his voice. Do not provoke him, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. So this angel embodies my nature. What I am, he is. My name means my nature. He possesses my nature, which is why he can do what only God can do, forgive sins. So you better obey him, hear his voice, or he'll be angry and won't forgive your sins. But if you obey his voice, he will go before you to bring you into Canaan. Let's go to Matthew 17, verses 1 and 2. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. After six days, day seven, Jesus takes them to a high mountain. They see his true inner abiding divine glory radiate through his physical body. His face shines like the sun, his clothes whiter than snow. Who shows up? Three and four. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with them. There's Moses again and Elijah. And both Moses and Elijah appear on the mount on the seventh day, where Jesus, Peter, James, and John are. And they see Jesus' true inner abiding divine glory Radiating through his physical body. Oh, my goodness. What's happening here? And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Tabernacles, sound familiar? The Israelites were living in tents, tabernacles in the wilderness. Tents, tabernacles. But then who shows up in verse 5? Who shows up in verse 5? Matthew 17, verse 5. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. The cloud comes down on the mountain. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Wait, does that sound familiar? God comes down in a cloud on a mount, tells Moses, This is my angel. Hear his voice. Because if you anger him, he won't forgive you. And he won't bring you into the promised land. What? What? Let it sink in. Did it sink in before I move on? Do you see how these true historical facts, historical events that truly took place, showing that the triune God is sovereign almighty over history, He's guiding these events in such perfect, meticulous ways, pointing to the greater revelation of Jesus Christ. 
the cloud came down on the mount like it did for Moses on Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai. And on that mount, God told Moses, I send my angel ahead of you. Hear his voice and don't provoke him. Because if you do, he won't forgive your sins, for your sins for my name is in him. Here you have Jesus on a mount with Moses, Elijah, Peter, James, and John. Cloud coming down. And now that same voice is telling Peter, James, and John, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. In other words, here's that angel in the flesh. The same angel that Israel was supposed to listen to that Peter, James, and John are now commanded to listen and obey. You got it? You see how everything's pointing to Jesus? And by the way, who brought the Israelites into the promised land? The angel of the Lord using Joshua. Who brings the people of God into the heavenly promised land, Canaan? The angel of the Lord who became flesh, whose name is Joshua. So you see Jesus is both the angel of the Lord and Joshua. He's both in one. What? Are you kidding me? Okay, everyone got it? Now let me show you something else. This is just beginning, man. You, you think this is blowing you away. John 1, 17. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. What does Moses represent? Moses represents the law, right? Moses represents the law, Jesus, grace, and truth. Okay, now let me now blow your minds away. I've mentioned all of these in previous sessions, but we're bringing it all together in one session. Moses was not allowed to enter the promised land. Let me explain to you why. Write down, we're not going to quote this, but I need your attention. Write down Numbers 20, verses 1 to 13. Write this down as the Spirit enables me to recall the scriptures. We're not going to quote it. I'm going to sum it up. The Israelites again complained that there was no water in the desert. Again, this was the second time. So God told Moses, I will stand by the rock. Speak to the rock, command the rock, and water will gush forth. It says Moses, being rash and angry, because the people were stiff-necked, took the rod in his hand, and he struck and hit the rock twice, and water came out. God got angry with Moses. Pay attention. God says, you did not honor me before these people. I told you to speak to the rock, not strike it. But because you struck the rock and you dishonored me, I will let you see the promised land from a distance, but you will not enter. You're going to die in the wilderness. Okay, everyone got it? Okay, let me explain why this is important. Because the first time, Exodus 17, verses 1 to 7. We're not going to read it. You read it. Exodus 17, verses 1 to 7. Years earlier, the first time when they complained, we're going to die in the desert, there's no water. The Lord God told Moses, Strike the rock with your rod and staff, and water will gush forth. So in Exodus 17, verses 1 to 7, Moses struck the rock. This time he's allowed to physically strike it, and water came forth and sustained them. The second time around, he was to speak to the rock, not strike it. Why was God angry with Moses striking it the second time around, whereas the first time around, he allowed him to strike it. Go to 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 to 4. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 to 4. If you're paying attention, you're going to make the connection. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud. That's the Father and Jesus in the cloud guiding them. All passed through the sea, the Red Sea. All were baptized into Moses, united to Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. That's why Moses was commanded to strike the rock the first time. Because when you strike Christ on the cross, that's when he gives you living waters. But you cannot strike Christ a second time because he was struck down once for all and cannot be stricken a second or third or fourth time. It was pointing to Jesus' crucifixion, bringing living waters. You got it? That's why in Exodus 17, 1 to 7, it says, strike it, because that's a picture of Jesus, the spiritual rock, 
being struck on the cross to give us living waters, the Holy Spirit. John 7, 38 to 39. That's why the second time around, he says, speak to the rock. It's already been struck. You don't need to crucify Jesus a second time. He's been struck once and for all, never to be struck again. To do so is blasphemy. Hebrews 6, verses 4 to 6. Hebrews 6, 4 to 6. For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. If they fall away to renew them, once they're cut off and they've reached the point of no return and blasting the Spirit, they can't be restored to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. And Christ won't be crucified a second time. So then Moses didn't bring them into the promised land. Who did? Joshua, right? Joshua, Yehoshua, Yeshua, Jesus. So in God, not allowing Moses to bring them, but allowing Jesus to do so, he was pointing to Jesus as the means by which you enter God's rest, not through the law of Moses. Do you see that too? Is it a coincidence that the one who led them, his name is Jesus after Moses, not Simeon or Aaron? So even in the replacement of Moses, you got a picture of Jesus. Because Joshua, Yehoshua, is which, where we get the name Yeshua, Jesus from. So Moses didn't bring them in. Jesus did. Because Moses can't bring you into rest by the law. Only Jesus, Joshua, can bring you in by his grace. Whoa! You see how it's all pointing to Jesus? Tell me what are the odds that Moses was replaced by Joshua, whose Hebrew name, Yehoshua, is where we get Yeshua, Jesus. So Moses didn't bring them into rest. Jesus did. What? Can I get an amen? Now let me show you something even more deep. Go to Numbers 13, verse 16. Numbers 13, verse 16. These are the names of the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land. Moses called Hoshea, the son of Nun, Joshua. God had Moses deliberately change Joshua's name from Hoshea to Joshua. Coincidence? His name was Hoshea. It was changed to Joshua. Moses changed it to Joshua. Who do you think told Moses to do that? Why? Joshua. Hmm, what a coincidence. Why didn't you keep his name Hoshea? I still got a lot more. Now let me show you something that Justin Martyr mentioned as proof as a picture of Christ. Exodus 17, verses 8 to 16. The Amalekites hindered the Israelites in the wilderness and tried to kill them. And so Joshua fought them. Joshua and the army of Israel fought them. It says Moses went up on a mount, on a mount, like a mound, like a hill, on a hill. And he would stretch out his hands. It says as long as his hands were stretched out, Joshua would win. But as he got tired and his hands went down, Joshua would lose. So he sat on a stone and Aaron and Hor on either side would keep his hands up, would lift up his hands. And as long as his hands were outstretched, Joshua would win. Okay, hold on. He's on a hill, on a mound, sitting on a stone. He and two others have his hands lifted up, and Joshua wins because of his the sign. The sign of what? The cross. And where was he? On a mound, a hill, on a stone, two others with him. Three. Three. Outstretched arms on a hill. On a mound, and Joshua wins against the enemies of God by the sign of Moses' outstretched hands. Let's read it. Exodus 17, 8 to 16. Now Amalek, Amalek came and fought with Israel and Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some men and go out fight with Amalek tomorrow. 
fight with them. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill. Where was Jesus crucified? On a hill, on a mound, Golgotha, with the rod of God in my hand. Notice rod, cross, rod. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. So notice when his hands went down, Joshua would lose. Now, how do I know it's two hands? Here's how I know. But Moses' hands, plural, became heavy. So they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat on And Aaron and Hur supported his hands one on one side, the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Just like Jesus' hands were steady until the sun set and they took him off before the sun set. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people at the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar, called its name, The Lord is my banner, Jehovah is my banner. For he said, Because Jehovah the Lord has sworn, the Lord Jehovah will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Hands supported by two, sitting on a stone with a rod in his hand on a hill. Jesus hung on a rod, outstretched hands in unit the Father and the Spirit. And by that cross, we are victorious over our enemy, Satan. Ow, ow, ow. John 19, 17. And he, bearing his cross, went to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. Luke 23, 32, 33. There was also two others, criminals led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him. The criminals, one on the right hand and, on, and the other on the left. Even one to the right and left. That's three. Thun! You see it. You see how it's all pointing to Jesus now? It's all pointing to Jesus. You see it, fuck up. You see it. Everyone got it? All right. There's more. Are you ready? Why did God punish the Israelites in the desert where they had to remain in the desert for 40 years? Why God had them stay in the desert for 40 years? Let's go. Numbers 13, 31 to 33. Why did Israel remain 40 years in the desert? Think with me. But the men, God had sent out 12 spies from the 12 tribes of Israel to scout the land of Canaan to see if it was as God said. Took them 40 days to scout the land. They came back 40 days later. Pay attention. But the man who got up with him said, we are not able to go up against this people for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report on the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. So now the people got afraid. Ten of the twelve spies caused the Israelites to be afraid, struck terror, in their hearts, so that they started crying, saying, we don't want to go. We don't want to enter the land. Joshua and Caleb said, no, 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 no. Hey, man, it's everything God said it would be, a land flowing of milk and honey. Don't be afraid. God fights for us. Let us go and kill them. God is with us. And they didn't go. They were afraid. So how many days did it take them to scout the land? 40 days. So what's their punishment? Let's see what their punishment is. Numbers 14, 33 to 34. And your son shall be shepherds in the wilderness 40 years. Why 40 years? And bear the brunt of your infidelity until your carcass and you die, but your children will enter, are consumed in the wilderness. Now, why 40 years? Pay attention. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days. So each day you'll spend a year in the wilderness. 40 days, 40 years. For each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely 40 years, and you shall know my rejection. Do you catch it? 40 days it took them to scout the land. Each day it took, you're going to stay a year in the desert as punishment. 40 days equals 40 years. 
You're all going to die. Your children will enter, not you. 40 days equals 40 years. 40 years equals 40 days. Now let's go to Deuteronomy 8, verses 1 of 5. Deuteronomy 8, verses 1 of 5. Every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. Now watch here. And you shall remember the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, expose what's in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Watch verse three, very important verse. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but shall live, but he shall live, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Your garments do not wear out on you, nor did your feet swell these 40 years. Now notice five. You should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. So notice, I brought you into the wilderness and I punished you for 40 years in the wilderness to train you, discipline you, that you are to depend on my word, not just on physical nourishment, because I was treating you as a son. So I was training you as a son, punishing you for your sins as a good father punishes a rebellion son so that I can get your attention, cause you to repent and build you up and make you a strong son. How many years? 40 years. Why? For the 40 days. Tell me if this is a coincidence. Matthew 4 verses 1 to 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he, Jesus, answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He just quoted Deuteronomy 8, 3. Bam! Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness, equivalent to Israel's 40 years in the wilderness. Jesus is God's true son who went into the wilderness to be trained and disciplined by his father, and he passed. Israel's God's son that went into the wilderness and failed. So, new exodus. New Israel, new covenant, new law, new Pharaoh, new Egypt, new Canaan. I think I said new wilderness. New Moses, new Joshua, all wrapped up in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And if you still don't get it, let me now give you the icing on the cake. Are you ready to go? No way. This can't be true. I'm shocked. You ready? Okay. The last two plagues that hit Egypt before Israel came out. The last two plagues. Pitch darkness for three days. Exodus 10, 21 to 23. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, darkness which may even be felt. Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. That was the second to last plague. So what was the last plague? Long chapter we're not going to read. Okay, get ready now. This is where you're going to be on your knees with your face to the ground in tears of love and worship and praise of the triune God that he is real. Jesus lives and the Bible is his word. Get ready now. What was the last plague? Exodus 12. We're not going to read it. It's too long. Let me sum it up. God says to Moses, tell the Israelites to find a one-year-old male lamb. Slay that lamb. Eat the flesh. Don't break any of its bones. Take the blood. Take the blood. Mix it with hyssop, bitter herbs. Take that mixture. Put it on the top and the sides of the doors. Do not leave any of the meat till the next day. When I see the blood, I will pass over that house. But any house that doesn't have the blood, hasn't eaten the lamb, their firstborn will be killed from the firstborn of Pharaoh to the firstborn of all the cattle. Okay, now, Exodus 12, 46. 
In one house it shall be eaten and shall not carry any of the flesh outside the house, nor shall you break any of its bones. Right? Okay. All right. Get ready. Who's Jesus? 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. So Jesus was sacrificed, right? He's our Passover, right? Is it a coincidence? Jesus was crucified on Passover, the week of Passover. Is it a coincidence that Jesus, when he was crucified, was God's firstborn son being slain? Is it a coincidence that when Christ was crucified, darkness fell on the land from noon to 3 p.m.? Is it a coincidence that though he was crucified, not one of his bones were broken? John 19, 34 to 36. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And is it a coincidence they gave him hyssop to drink as he experienced a bitter death? John 19, 28 to 29. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. Sour, bitter wine, hyssop, bitter death, bitter herbs, hyssop mixed with the blood. You place that on your heart, on your mind, on your ears in consecration to the Lamb. And when you eat his flesh, drink his blood, death passes over you. <whistles> eat his flesh, drink his blood, have the blood of Christ, right? Mixed with that hyssop, sour, bitter wine, experiencing a bitter death, applied to your head, your mind, your ears, your heart, in consecration to the lamb who was slain. What? And then, finally, John 8, 12. Who is Jesus? John 8, 12. John 8, 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Luke twenty two fifty three, 53, when I was with you daily in the temple, you did not try to seize me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. The light of the world was engulfed in darkness for three days, three days. And then the light of the world destroyed through the darkness, swallowed up the darkness on the third day. Just like in Exodus 10, 21, 23, it was pitch darkness for three days. Man, what's this place, man? Man, I don't know, man. Yep. Purge me with hyssop and I'll be clean, Tim C. Psalm 51.7. Everyone got it?